Good morning or afternoon everyone and welcome to the 2017 Yearly Tax Update Webinar presented by Heinen Associates. I'm Shannon Reddy, your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we start, let's take a moment to cover a few housekeeping items. All audio lines are muted. Please use our chat feature to ask questions. It will save time at the end for Q&A. This webinar is being recorded. Links to the webinar slides and its recording will be sent out to all registrants later today. Your active participation is important throughout the session. In order to receive CPE credit for this session, you will need to be connected for a minimum of 50 minutes and must answer 75% of the polling questions included throughout the presentation. Immediately following the webinar, this webinar, you will be directed to a survey page where you can leave comments. Please check your inbox later today for a follow-up email that contains an evaluation form that must be submitted in order to receive your CPE certificate for the course. Our presenter today is John Monahan, a tax partner in our Denver office. John joined Heine Associates as a partner in 2016. With over 25 years of experience, he specializes in providing advice to corporate taxpayers. In particular, John advises companies on tax compliance and income tax reporting matters, which include tax filing positions, complete transactions, ASC 740 reporting requirements, and Sarbanes-Oxley 404 requirements. Thank you for attending today, and I would like to introduce John Monahan. Thank you, Shannon, and welcome, everyone. I have a lot of items to go over today, a lot of areas. We'll be taking more of a, a top-level analysis of this, but definitely want to communicate the issues and raise awareness, in, especially around the congressional acts and tax legislation that's new and will affect corporations, partnerships, individuals, and so on. So the, next, the first section I'd like to talk about is the congressional acts and tax legislation that's new or recent for this year that will definitely affect 2016 and 2017. One of, the, one of the major items that we had enacted at the end of 2015 was the PATH Act. This is a very taxpayer favorable act. And some of the parts of that act I will discuss now. Uh, first, there's an exclusion on corporation stock gain for certain types of sales for qualified small businesses. And some of the requirements on that are that the qualified business, small business is held for more than five years, is a five-year holding period. And to be a qualified small business under this, under this act, the stock must be directly acquired via an original issuance, and it must be C corporation stock. The asset tax basis must be more, no more than 50 million, so definitely applies to your small to middle market type of companies. And the corporation must conduct an active trade or business. If all these things are met, 100% of the gain can be excluded on a permanent basis. Interesting uh, recent private letter ruling it was a case where a, a stock in a new corporation retained its status even though it was converted to an LLC. But the key was that it elected to be taxed as a C corporation. So in that particular situation, this company also met the requirements of the exclusion of the gain. Another item within the PATH Act is the R&D credits. Not only did it make the credit permanent, which after 34 years of temporary renewals, it's finally permanent, but it also put two items of interest or two areas that are definitely beneficial for smaller companies and can result in a tax benefit, even though the company might, not, might be generating losses and not have regular tax liability. So the first one I'll mention is this allowance of a tax credit against your AMT liability for certain businesses. And these businesses are generally smaller, again, less than $50 million in gross receipts. And there's certain qualifying businesses. They have to be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a non-publicly traded corporation. And for pass-throughs, the receipts test, the 50 million gross receipts test, must be met both at a corporate level or at a business level and at an owner level. Another R&D credit um, 
area that's allowed now is, is actually smaller businesses can take the R&D credit against their payroll tax. Again, there's certain requirements there, definitely with kind of your startup businesses. And so the businesses with less than $5 million in gross receipts will qualify for that. And what the mechanism is in doing that is they make an election on their return to carve out a piece of their R&D credit and apply that against their payroll tax. And when they do that, they will do that through their payroll tax filings in the first quarter after they make that election in the, in the business return that is filed. So these qualifying businesses for this type of credit are all corporations, even publicly traded corporations and partnerships. And there's a $250,000 maximum benefit per year on this. And, and so it, it applies for the first five years that the company is, is generating gross receipts. So like I said, definitely geared towards your startup type businesses. Also in the PAST Act, Section 179 expensing was made permanent. And that the, uh, the high $500,000 expense threshold is the one that was put made permanent. So that's going to apply to your traditional types of assets that are acquired, but also it's going to apply to qualified real property, where in the past it had a smaller expensing threshold of $250,000. Now they also have a $500,000 expense limitation. The, the expense will phase out over $2 million, but that will be indexed over with inflation, so it will grow over time. Bonus depreciation, while not, not a permanent extension, and it actually will phase out over time, and you can see here on the slide from 50% in the next two, three years down to 30% in 2019, and then it is set to sunset, barring any other renewals. So... The important part about this is bonus depreciation will be, you will be able to take that with certain qualified improvement property. And like qualified leasehold improvements in past law, only the definition of the property is, is expanded greatly. In fact, you can pretty much take it on all types of leasehold improvements and pretty much the requirements are that it has to be the interior portion of a non-residential building. It does not need to be pursuant to a lease like you had with the old qualified leasehold improvements and it does not need to be made three years after the building is placed in service. Again, that was a requirement with the old qualified leasehold improvements. So expanded it greatly. In fact, the only things that are exclusions at this point are enlargements of the building, interior structure improvements, and escalator or elevator um, placements. So again, a great benefit, very, uh, very beneficial for businesses. So other things in the uh, new legislation that are either uh, have passed or are making their way through Congress. The first one I'll mention is uh, this empowering employees through stock ownership. This has passed the House and it's been sent to the, the Senate. Really what it does is it makes it easier for startups and small businesses to give stock as compensation to their employees, yet not penalize them for the value of that stock given and them not having the cash to pay the tax. So. What it does is allow employees to elect to defer the income attributable to certain stock transferred to them, and the election must be made 30 days after the vesting of the stock. And it defers, like I said, defers the income to the date the stock is either sold or it's readily tradable. Now, the extenders, there's several that were not extended by the end of the year, and the thought is that... Um, it, they will be extended in 2017 and probably made retroactive, but as it stands now, they have not been extended. And so there are things like claiming a higher tuition and fee deduction, mortgage debt forgiveness, and certain credits that were, were allowed. So stay tuned for that, but the feeling is that as part of the, some of the new tax legislation that will come in 2017, that you will see some of these items extended. And so with that, I think we have a question. Yes, we have our first polling question. With the new PASS Act beginning January 1, 2016, research and development credits are now allowed to reduce alternative minimum tax for companies with average gross receipts less than A, $10 million, B, $50 million, C, $5 million, D, any size company would qualify. Now on this screen, Please select your answer and to receive your CTE.
Okay, thank you. And uh, the most right answer was the $50 million number, although technically you could say $5 million is under that threshold as well. But $50 million is, is the most right answer in this circumstance. So let's go on to other changes. Interesting to note, one of a, uh, the more recent studies of the OECD countries has shown that the amount of tax revenue has risen 10 basis points, and it's really driven by income tax, which is unusual because in many of the prior years it was driven by consumption type taxes. So interesting to note that, that how, how the uh, tax revenues are driven worldwide. Other changes of note, the repair regulations, which came out a, a few years ago where you were able to expense certain de, de minimis property acquisitions. There has been a new notice come out recently where the threshold for that is increased from 500 to 2,500 for those taxpayers without an applicable financial statement. By applicable financial statement, that's usually meant to be an audited financial statement. So there's that ability to expense those small items and that limit was actually increased because the 500 was considered too low to be effective to reduce the, the burden on small businesses. So. Definitely a, a, a taxpayer-friendly item, and it, it, it eases the record-keeping requirements of having to capitalize all these types of things. So people with an applicable financial statement can expense more, but they usually have to be in line with the policy that they have for financial statement purposes. So these are for companies without that applicable financial statement. Other types of things of note, there has been this proposal from the Depart Department of Labor that was going to raise the investment advice standards for retirement accounts. But however, at this point, it's, it's felt by having Trump be elected president that uh, that will threaten that, that rule and that will go away. So keep that in mind. And then also other tax accounting changes that have to do with the accounting method consent rules have been expanded for both automatic and advanced consent, consent procedures. Now, 2015-14 was also released, and that, that basically adds new types of accounting method changes to the list that can be automatic changes. What 2015-13 also does is change the filing requirement for companies under an IRS exam, and I think it widens the window for them being able to file for an accounting method change. It also shortens the 481 adjustment period for positive positive adjustments that normally you were able to um, prorate over four years, but you can do it in one year if you so desire, if you're, you have an eligible acquisition transaction. Now we're going to focus on partnerships and corporations and how some of the new legislation affects both of those types of entities. First of all, partnerships, which are very much widely scrutinized these days, uh, just a basic statistic, there's been 3.6 million partnership returns filed in the most recent analysis and 27 million partnership K-1s have been filed. So one of the major changes are in regard to the partnership audits, which used to be under TEFR requirements for large partnerships. Now not only can they audit at the partnership level, but they can also assess tax at the partnership level. So that's, that's different than the old TEFRT requirements. Leveraged partnerships are especially scrutinized, especially where, where we have these situations where there could be a disguised sale, where there's contrib contribution of property and then a, a distribution thereafter. And so what this what the new rules under 707 and 750 do is treat all partnership liabilities as non-recourse liabilities. So that has an effect on the distribution, whereas before it would be distributed based on the recourse liabilities, under the non-recourse liability treatment, it's distributed based on the relative ownership interest of the partners. So that's a difference and that frustrates the disguised sales motivation. Also, there's been a strategy to have a disregarded entity under a partnership and have employees paid by that disregarded entity. What that's trying to do basically is to get around the self-employed tax rules. And so having that paid out of the disregarded entity, they would treat it as employee and not subject to self-employment tax. 
And that, that strategy is being dis disregarded with this new legislation. Also proposed regulations that deal with these kind of investment partnerships that try to recharacterize ordinary income into investment type income and therefore get capital gain treatment on certain transactions and a lower tax. Some types of transactions or, that are like that are this example of management fee waivers that are exchanged for profits interest and in an attempt to get distributions that pertain to the profit interest and treat it as a, as a favorable transaction, a favorable either co a distribution of capital or a capital gain. So that's a common transaction that's, that's being targeted in this. And so what, what, what the new regulations look to do is see what the, does the arrangement lack sufficient entrepreneurial risk? Entrepreneurial risk would determine if you have this kind of investment type motivation and therefore capital gain activity. So looking, scrutinizing this heavily to see if some things can be recharacterized as ordinary income and thus subject to the higher rate. In the corporate area, there's several new regulations, one dealing with Section 385, and this is taking a look at companies that have debt and, tr and deduct interest expense and scrutinizing this heavily, especially around the substantiation behind the debt, and in some cases recharacterizing that debt as equity, and therefore interest payments are no longer deductible because they're treated as dividends. The dividends are not deductible. So there's that issue, and then there's also the spinoff um, code section 355, which is a reorganization code section, treats a spinoff as a tax-free reorganization. But in the past, there's been abuses in that, in, in that there's been an attempt to kind of what they call a device, and that is to distribute earnings and profits tax-free through a spinoff mechanism. So what they're doing is looking at these, for, first of all, to have a bright line test on if this is in fact a device, and also to see if there's an active trade or business as a result of this. So they're going to look at disproportional distributions and look at and see the content of the assets in the new corporation. And, and if you're less than 5% of fair market of the corporation and gross assets is under, under the active business assets that normally would not qualify. Section 83B. Section 83B, if you don't already know, is when a recipient of a stock award can make an election to have it taxed on the current value. And in many cases, the idea is there that the value is low and they receive it. So we'll treat it as being taxed at that point. And then when it subsequently vests and is sold, they'll be subject to the capital gain rates on the subsequent appreciation. So on that Section 83B election, there's been a couple new procedural rules. You no longer have to file the election with the return, and that's done to facilitate e-filing of the return, but you still do have to file the, e -file, the 83B election 30, within 30 days of the transfer of the property. So this is going to pertain to, most, in most cases, restricted stock awards and or profits interests. Another interesting case out there called, I'm going to assassinate the name here, Goodmanson, but in this case, stock was transferred to a, a recipient and there, the substantial risk of forfeiture had lapsed, but there were certain internal things that kept the recipient from selling the stock. And what the court said is that there was still income there because what that should be based on is the lapse of substantial risk of forfeiture. And even though there was a prohibition against selling, selling the stock through, through the type of items that you see there listed, that was not... Um, a requirement of of 83B. So they were they were required to um, they were it was not sorry it was not a requirement of the recipient of a stock award. So once that substantial risk of forfeiture lapsed, that value at that time was required to be reported as income, and, and those other restrictions really didn't did not matter. So on to another question. Question number two. Thank you. With the new rules pertaining to Section 83B, recipients of equity awards must A, submit a copy of the 83B election with the return, B, 
file the 83B election separately with the IRS within 30 days of transfer of property. C, both of the above. D, none of the above. Please select your answer on this screen. And the answer to that question is, is B. It's actually B. You no longer have to do the requirement of attaching to your return. So it's not both of the above. It's, it's simply B. You have to file it 30 days after you receive it. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about some new regulations that pertain to F reorganizations. If you don't already know, an F reorganization is one of the sections of the reorganization code sections under 368, but it, it simply deals with the mere change in identity, form, or place of organization. And there's certain transactions that now are allowed under the F reorganization rules that can qualify as an F reorganization and thus non-taxable treatment. And one of the ones that we're seeing is when, when a shareholder basically contributes shares of stock to a newly formed corporation and takes back stock of that newly formed corporation. We're calling it the resulting corporation in this example. And so when that happens, it can be treated as a tax free reorganization, an F reorganization, but there are certain requirements that have to be met. The same person must own stock of both the distributing corporation and the resulting corporation. And the resulting corporation must not hold any property or any attributes before that. It should just be a newly formed company without any assets in the corporation that's going to hold stock in the contributed corporation. And so, also, the transfer corporation must completely liquidate, liquidate in the F reorganization. This can also be accomplished if that new if that contributed corporation is an LLC and this becomes disregarded because it's a single member LLC. The resulting corporation is the only, can be the only acquiring corporation and the transfer corporation can be the only acquired corporation. The continuity of business enterprise requirements and the continuity of interest that you normally see in these other reorganization procedures are not required for the F reorganization in this case. Okay, a couple things in the estate area. There, is, there has been some controversy about some new rules who, that attempted to eliminate discounts on basically business interest, interest in corporations and interest in partnerships. And that's come under a lot of scrutiny because the feeling was those rules were really meant to apply to discounts around investment type partnerships, master limited partnerships. But it was, it was applied very broad-based and so applied to all business interests, including operating businesses. So there's been a lot of pushback around that. And basically, at this point, the ASCPA has, has requested that the IRS withdraw and repropose these rules based on intent. And so this, this might be all moot anyway, because under the new Trump proposals, one of the items in there is to eliminate the estate and gift taxes altogether. In the real estate area, there's a few cases out there and a few issues that we're seeing. One is the case of a state of Bartell versus Commissioner, where this deals with basically like-kind exchanges under Section 1031 and the non-recognition treatment under 10, that 1031 affords. In this case, the 180-day safe harbor was exceeded, but what had happened is, is the company had used a qualified intermediary to place the property until the construction was completed. And the court case approved this and said that it met the requirements of the non-recognition treatment. So this is a, a little bit of an expans expansion on the safe harbor rule. The other item is conservation easements. There have been many people that have donated, contributed conservation easements, but there's been basically a bogus or questionable valuation, allowance, or valuation around those easements. So 
increase the uh, contribution deduction. That's been scrutinized by the IRS, and in a court case uh, called LEG, that was basically disallowed because the gross valuation had no substantiation around that. So there's been some scrutiny around that. The unintended consequence of that, unfortunately, is there's been fewer contributions of conservation easements to get that charitable contribution deduction. Also in the real estate area is this land banking that's done. And this is a process where a holder of land is trying to basically be treated as an investor rather than a dealer. And being treated as an investor will involve being taxed at a capital gain rate when the property is sold. So what they've done is have two discrete pieces of a transaction. And what they do is sell a holy, to a wholly owned corporation and it, in, in many cases taking back a note, must be a real note. So that's the investor treatment, and capital gain would be allowed on that transaction. And then subsequently, the corporation acts as a dealer and develops the land. The land when it was donated or sold to the corporation was, was not developed, but the corporation will develop it and sell it, and then the corporation will be subject to ordinary income as a dealer. One of the things that we have to watch out for on this type of transaction, though, is Section 1239, which relates to related party rules, which might recharacterize any capital gain as ordinary income. Other issues. The IRS has uh, recently released a warning on the type of tax scams that are out there now, so I, I just want to talk about a few of those. Uh, one of the more common ones is when the IRS calls calls your your home and and claims that you're you have done a legal activity and that they require an immediate payment and this is your last warning before legal action. Obviously, the IRS doesn't do that. They don't call your house. They don't threaten you, and they don't for sure require information from you over the phone. So that's something to be wary of. And also, there's been issue with issues where there's they posed as a having assessed a federal student tax and threatening to take away the student's tuition. So that's going on as, as well. There's been fake bills related or sending a fake bill related to the Affordable Care Act. There's been soliciting information from the payroll department or the HR professionals within a corporation. And they do that basically through a phishing scam where they pretend to be a corporate exec, ex, executive trying to get sensitive information. Also, imitating software providers to trick tax professionals into downloading what's, quote, they say is an update, but really what it is is a software designed to track keystrokes. So when you type in your password or your, si your sign-in info, login info, they know what that is. So be very wary of that. Also, verify somebody posing as someone verifying tax information over the phone and requesting very sensitive information. And finally, pretending to to be in a tax preparer seeking tax information, which in many cases is, is tax sensitive, like social security numbers and so forth. So just, just some of the things to be aware of. Other types of activities, one is dealing with the factor requirements. The IRS has made an attempt to simplify this and done so by having uh, an ability for companies to have an agreement with the IRS if they have foreign financial accounts and, and, and basically simplifying the reporting of that and the requirements, showing the requirements of that. Also is a tax rate reduction, the proposed tax rate reduction through some of these proposals that both Trump and Congress are talking about has initially um, promoted some companies to move back, uh, decide to move their company back to the U.S. So this has happened with a company called SoftBank. We will see if that continues, but if this is a trend to continue, but that, that has happened because SoftBank has been inspired by the plans to, for tax overhaul and regulatory reduction. So more to come, we'll see. Individual updates. Like I mentioned before, there were several extenders in play that didn't get renewed. The PATH Act had extended some of the more beneficial ones, but only tell 1117. And some of the, the more beneficial ones that, that were not extended are the above the line deduction for qualified tuition and related expenses, 
Maximum de deduction was 4,000, but then again, that sunsets it's in 1231.16. The PATH Act also extended the exclusion from gross, in gross income of discharge qualified principal residence debt, but again, that expired at the end of 2016. A couple other ones that were very beneficial was to treat mortgage insurance premiums as qualified residential interest to deduct, also sunsetted in 2016. And finally, there's been this, uh, there were non-business energy property credits, but they were on only available for property placed in service before January 1st, 2017. Other individual changes, there's now a self-certification procedure for taxpayers, and this pertains to retirement plans where they've had perhaps a, an early distribution. So this avoids, can avoid the early distribution taxes if they are able to kind of self-certify, and that's done through a streamlined process without applying for a, a private letter ruling. And basically what that does is if you qualify for certain listed circumstances that the IRS provides, that they will issue a waiver. Rather than having to go through the pain and suffering of seeking a private letter ruling, you can do this. So that's a very positive change. Another case that, a US tax court case that recently came out is Voss. And that basically pertains to the ability to deduct mortgage interest expense, but that's only up until a debt limit of 1.1 million. What, what had happened in the past for unmarried taxpayers that co-owned property is they were basically treated as dividing that limit, but under the, the Voss Court case, they were able to qualify and have separate limits for, for each, each one of them. Now the marital status for the entire year is determined at the end of the year. Also, in cases of sex, same-sex marriage, the federal jurisdiction will recognize marriage if it's recognized within the state where the marriage takes place. Polling question number three. Several tax provisions were not extended by Congress by the 1231-2016 year end. Which of the following individual tax items were not extended? A, exclusion from gross income of qualified discharged qualified principal residence debt, B, deduction for qualified tuition and related expenses, C, treatment of mortgage insurance premium as qualified mortgage interest, D, all of the above. Please select your answer on this screen. And so the overwhelming answer is all of the above, which, which is the correct answer. Very good. Okay, now I'd like to focus on some of the recent Trump and uh, Republican tax proposals and what that, that means for us in the future. First of all, I'll talk about some of the things that, that Trump has proposed in his plan as it stands now. First, the business tax rate would be decrease from 35% to 15%. Now, that's not only corporations, but also on a pass-through basis, they would be allowed to be taxed at 15% and also for sole proprietorships if elected. Also, the corporate AMT would be eliminated. But the question there is for those corporations that have an AMT credit carry forward, what happens to that carry forward if, in fact, the corporate AMT is, is eliminated? Also a big item in the proposal is the deemed repatriation of corporate profits held offshore. Get kind of a, t a tax holiday on that repatriation, where, whereas re before, if you repatriated, it'd be subject to the corporate tax rate in place that you have now, you would get a tax, a, a very much a reduced tax rate of 10%. And so the idea is to promote repatriation of those earnings back to the US. Also, most corporate tax expenditures except the R&D would be eliminated. There hasn't been really a definition of what corporate tax expenditures really are. I will say they're more in the line of you know, special tax expenses like a, a Section 199, so I, I think that could potentially be eliminated. 
also potentially other kinds of tax credits. So those types of tax specific expenditures or credits I think would be targets under this new proposal. Also this uh, proposal allows businesses who are engaged in manufacturing basically to expense their capital investment. So very much an uh, uh, incentive for US based manufacturing but if they do expense capital investment they cannot expense interest. So it's an election either to do this or to expense interest. So those are the, the major Trump proposals. The, the GOP proposals on the next slide are in many cases a mirror of the Trump proposals but also a few differences and an expansion. Their list is more expansive. So we'll go over those here. Like like the Trump proposal, the small business tax rates for sole proprietorships and pass-through entities would be reduced. Uh, they wouldn't be at the maximum individual rate, but they would be, I think the limit would be 25% as it currently stands now for active business income. The corporate rate, the corporate rate would be reduced to 20%. And again, there would be an immediate, immediate expensing of the cost of business investments. Now this wouldn't be limited to the manufacturing sector in the GOP proposal. It would be all types of businesses and it would apply to plant equipment and intangibles. Interest expense would still be allowed even if you expensed capital investment, but it would be limited to interest income. Any excess interest expense could be carried forward. And so on the next slide, a few more things under the GOP proposal. The NOL carry forwards, instead of having a 20-year limited life, would have an indefinite carry forward period. And under this proposal, carrybacks would be eliminated. The actual amount of the interest, the NOL carry forward would be incre increased over time by an interest factor, so keeping pace with inflation. And so the, the next one is R&D credits. Would, would retain our ending credits, but have them may be more effective. What that means, I'm not sure at this point. It's, it hasn't been clearly defined. But R&Ds are, R&D credits are very much uh, politically popular. It, it promotes innovation and research and development within the United States. So, so politically popular to keep that. Also eliminate certain special interest deductions. Again, at this point in time, that's very unspecified. So. We will provide more detail on that later. What, what the GOP proposal really wants to do is shift to a territorial tax system. And right now the U.S. is under a worldwide tax system that basically taxes all income worldwide. It might defer a portion of your income for your in income earned in foreign countries, but if you eventually bring it to the U.S., back to the U.S., it will tax that income. So all income worldwide. We're the outlier in that regard. Most countries use the territorial system. So what that would do in the U.S. would tax only the income earned within the borders of the U.S., whether that be companies that were headquartered in the U.S. or headquartered in foreign countries. And essentially, income earned out of the country would be tax-free. So that's the system that, that they're playing with now. It, it puts it more on a level playing field with other countries and is in keeping with lowering the rate to be more competitive and in, in comparison with other countries as well. The U.S. rate as it stands now is one of the highest in the world. I'm sure everybody's aware of that. Us and Japan are the two highest rates. Also, I, I do want to mention that there's this talk about a border tax, a border adjustment, which would basically exempt exports from taxation, but um, deny deductions for imports. A lot of controversy around that right now. We'll see where that goes. Um, but that is out there. A few more items under the GOP tax proposal would be to simplify the international tax rules around subpart F. Subpart F is basically aimed at companies that have passive income overseas and it recharacterizes that income even though they haven't brought it back to the U.S. They, re they basically characterize that as deemed brought back to the, IRA, to the U.S. and then taxed at the U.S. tax rate. So they want to simplify the rules around that and, and actually eliminate subpart F. We'll see what happens there. It was really put in place to 
to curtail some abuses. You know, what, what the behaviors will happen after they eliminate subpart F is, is uncertain. But if we go to a territorial system, if, if repatriations are done of, of income earned overseas because of the lower tax rate, it, it really might not be that much of a, might not be that big of a deal. Also, 100% exemption for dividends from foreign subsidiaries is proposed in the GOP plan. That's a little bit different than the Trump plan in that it allows a, a complete exemption from, di from income tax. Finally, there's a move towards consumption-based taxes, which are you know, taxes like VAT or sales tax based on transactions, not based on income. So that's being talked about as well. Regarding the IRS, and there's been a lot of complaints about the IRS in recent years, mostly around service, also about their audit procedures, but mostly around service. But regarding the IRS, the GOP proposal is to streamline into three units, and those three units would be, the first would be families and individuals, the second would be businesses, and a third unit would be actually kind of like a small claims unit for quick dispute resolution. So that's the plan there. They want to be a service first, have a service first mission and really committing to taxpayer assistance. And whether that involves more staffing with the IRS or, or what will, remains to be seen. The leadership that they're proposing be, be basically appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate and the leadership of, would have a, a single three-year term. And finally, under the healthcare area, they're looking at replacing, as you know, the ACA uh, with something else, something that would be portable, something that would, people would have access to not only in their jobs, but in a non-working environment and also into retirement. And then there's some talk about looking at basically catch-up contributions in the HSA area for the spouse and basically use the same account to catch up, the same HSA account for catch-up contributions. So the last part of this, I have a top 10 list just like everyone else, and I'd like to um, go over the major areas, but these are the top 10 lists of 2016 developments ready for 2017. Number one, the Trump administration. A lot of uncertainty out there what's going to happen with, with corporate taxes, with, with individual taxes, but it, it's really going to depend on a lot of things. Basically, it's going to depend on comprehensive tax reform, whether we have the appetite to do that. There has not been comprehensive tax reform in this country since 1986. Also, a willingness, well, also concern over budget costs, you know, how is this going to get paid for, um, and a willingness to work with Democrats. Will this be something that they're not going to agree to, and will it have lasting power beyond the next election cycle? That's the question. So we'll... Remains to be seen on that. Number two, the scrutiny around debt versus equity and the recharacterization of debt to equity. So it's, what's happening now is, a, as we've talked about, it, we're establishing, or the IRS has established extensive documentation requirements around debt, especially related party debt. And it, it, it really just needs to show that it's bona fide, that it has the terms and conditions that outside party debt would show and so that will be looked at and scrutinized very heavily. And so a debt instrument issued after April 4th, 2016 can be recharacterized as equity in a specific transaction. Right now, this, this, these rules are limited to U.S. borrowers, and which makes sense because the play really is to put debt in the high-tax country, which is the U.S., and have that interest expense be deducted in the U.S., jurisdiction. Number three, partnership strategies. Greater scrutiny, like we said, there's going to be audits at the partnership level. Also around the leveraged transactions that are occurring when, when a partner donates property, appreciated property, that has a liability associated with it. And so the sky is sale activity is going to be very heavily scrutinized. And anything that uh, recourse liabilities, as we mentioned, will be for these purposes recharacterized as non-recourse liability. There's also going to be 
taking a look at what's called a bottom dollar obliga payment obligation, which is a form of guarantee basically to try to get recourse debt treatment, that's going to be heavily scrutinized as well. So the transactions were distributions that are built to eliminate the tax on distributions to partners from a contribution of appreciated property will no longer apply. And this is going to be in effect after January 3rd, 2017. Also in the partnership strategy area is the treatment of partners as employees in this whole avoidance of self-employment tax. There is, there actually, in, in the preamble of the regulations that eliminated the use of the disregarded entity LLCs to treat partners as employees, there is a preamble in that regulation that invites comments from people to talk about w when they think partners should be treated as employees. So they're definitely leaving the door open that, for that. And so we'll see what happens on that one. The new partnership audit regime, number four. As we talked about, the recently enacted Bipartisanship Budget Act 2015 repealed the current TEFRA, TEFRA regime, but put in its place an ability for the IRS to assess entity level tax on an imputed underpayment against the partnership. So this is for tax years after 1231-17. And a partnership may elect out of this, but not if required to furnish more than 100 K-1s or have a partner that is a trust or another partnership, which it can happen. It's, it's often the case where companies are structured that way, where they have multiple tiers of partnerships. So this, this in fact, would apply to those types of structures. Number five are the Section 355 spends, where companies are using a spinoff, non-taxable transaction, basically as a device to distribute earnings and profits that normally would be taxable as a dividend to a shareholder, but to distribute those tax-free using a spinoff transaction. So there's been some bright line tests around that, and mostly it focuses around active trade of business and disproportionate distributions. And with that, we have our last question. Thank you. Under the new uh, bipartisan regime resulting from the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, the IRS can A, audit the partnership entity level, B, assess tax at the partnership entity level, C, both of the above, D, neither of the above. Please select your answer on this screen. And the correct answer is, and the overwhelming answer is both of the above. C is the correct answer. Okay, continuing on with my top 10 list. Number six, BEPS, Base Erosion and Profit Sharing. Basically, there's a, a long list of action items that are out there, goals to better align um, where, where countries, where the business activity is actually making money and how it's being taxed. So the main concern are profits are not being taxed where the economic activity is occurring or where the value is being created. So what they want to do to combat that, combat aggressive tax planning, either through very aggressive you know, transfer pricing or, or something like that, they want to have several things that will improve information available to the tax authorities and get a better alignment of economic activity and how it's being taxed. So, so BEPS it, it will look at that. There, there's one item in BEPS in particular that's kind of post, well, one item in particular looking at are the inversions that are taking place where companies through a merger transaction are moving their corporate headquarters to a foreign location and then not subject to the U.S. worldwide tax rules. Part of uh, post-inversion transactions that they're really looking at are what's called in earning stripping, and that's when they basically push debt down into the U.S. jurisdiction, the high tax jurisdiction, and incur high you know, interest deductions that will get basically more bang for the buck because they'll get more of a tax reduction. So looking at that, they, they issued Code Section 385, which deals with the debt versus equity standard. And that, that is a very broad code section that applies to a lot of different areas. 
Number seven, the state valuation and basis reporting. We talked a little bit about the state dis valuation discounts. And right, currently, it's, it's, it's including operating businesses. There's now more scrutinize, scrutinization about excluding those. There's also uh, what they're looking at is consistent basis reporting, where they want the basis that uh, a recipient receives from a, a state um, from a state transaction to be the same as the value that was reported with, for estate tax purposes. Number eight, the sharing economy. There's a lot, the, sh the sharing economy is basically these things like Uber, or Airbnb, where you're providing a car or an apartment or a physical tangible thing. So what the IRS has done is they've launched the sharing economy tax center on its website to basically provide some guidance on these types of business transactions. Number nine, passive activity losses. There's been some more leniency with the IRS on this and, and the ability to basically group passive activities. And by grouping it in the past, they really, what they wanted to do is combine participation hours and improve one's ability to achieve the necessary hours for material participation and therefore not limited for not have a passive activity loss limitation. And finally, legislation and the lack thereof. There really hasn't been, it hasn't been a good year for legislation. It's really been kind of put on hold for pending the results of the election. But as you can see, there are a lot of things and there will be a lot of things in the 2017 years. So this time next year when we're doing this update, there are going to be a lot of things to talk about. So with that, I think we're, we'll, we'll take questions. We would now like to give our attendees a chance to ask questions. To ask a question, please submit a question via the chat box on the bottom left corner of your screen. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, our presenter will follow up via email. We have one question that came in uh, regarding the Trump and GOP tax proposals. Will the tax rate decrease for S corporation income? And the answer to that is yes, because it's a pass through. It, what they're proposing is the 15% tax on that type of income. Good, thank you. Another question that has come in, if a partnership is assessed tax on audit at the partnership level, what responsibility does the partner have for the tax if they join the partnership after the assessment year? That's a very good question. And the answer to that is, unfortunately, even though the partner wasn't a partner in the partnership at the time this adjustment was made, because the assessment is made at the partnership level, it has some implication to them. And that's the unfortunate part of this, is it will be assessed and it will be applied to the partners that exist at the time that that assessment is made, not to the year that it's being assessed again. So it will apply to them. And one final question. How are the new regulations addressing those situations where companies change their headquarters to a foreign country? Okay, this pertains to the inversion transactions that we talked about. And the regulations, the new regulations right now as it stands are they will basically ignore, ignore the stock transaction if a foreign company has had similar acquisitions within the last 36 months. And then they'll also basically ignore any pre-merger or pre-transaction distributions that are disproportional, where, where a company is basically trying to reduce the value in the U.S. before the transaction occurs. So, both of those types of items are in the new regulations, and that's designed to discourage right now inversions. And I think there will be more of that. But like I said, with, with the new proposals where we were talking about reducing the tax rate, where we were talking about having this kind of reduced tax holiday on repatriations, there's going to be less of an incentive to do inversions. Good. Thank you, John. That's all the time we have now for questions. Please check your inbox for a follow-up email with an evaluation form that must be submitted in order to receive your CPE certificate for the course. Thank you again for attending and